Uh, so welcome to the cross cultural centers uh, cross cultural webinar that we're hosting today. Uh, before we begin to welcome to provide a wor warm welcome to today's guest speaker, we want to start with our land acknowledgement for SCSU Imperial Valley. For millennial, the Kumeyaay, Quetzal, and Cocopa people have been part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many ger generations in relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State University community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony. We find inspiration from this land, the land of the Kumeyaay, Quetzal, and Cocopa. Beyond land acknowledgements, it's also important to pair these land acknowledgements with practices that um, are about, you know, whether it be creating uh, spaces of community and dialogue to, to learn about our Indigenous communities, to provide uh, platforms uh, for our Indigenous communities as well, to um, voice their stories, and also to learn about their with um, an Indigenous women incidents of Baja California, webinar speaker series and um, if you missed out on that session um, I will provide the link um, in our in our chat box where you can tune in and learn about activists uh, indigenous, indigenous women activists of Mexico but today today we have a very special guest from a uh, very special guest Dr. Ruben G. Mendoza and um, important to note that this uh, cross-cultural webinar is brought to us with the support of Dr. Nunez, with the support of Chica Nixin Fronteras, where we're hosting the in-person session, and with the support of this, our SDSU Imperial Student Union. And of course, also with the very generous um, support and time of Dr. R Dr. Ruben G. Mendoza. So a little bit of Dr. Ruben G. Mendoza. Dr. Ruben G. Mendoza is an archeologist, writer, photographer, and adventurer, and founding faculty member of the California State University, Monterrey Bay, and the School of, Psycho of Social, Behavioral, and Global Studies. And pr presently serves as the vice president of the board of directors of the Monterrey County History Historical Society. He has conducted archeological and ethnic ethno-historical investigations in the California mission, including mission, mission San Juan Bautista, San Carlos Borrameón, La, La Soledad, San Miguel Ar Arcajel, and the Spanish Royal Prese uh, Presidio of Monterrey. Besides his work on American Indian and Spanish colonial sites in the, U in the U.S. Southwest and Mesoamerica, his discovery of the Serra Chapel of 1770 and the 1772 advances studies into the life and times of the recent uh, uh, cano, canonized saint of uh, Fray uh, Jupiter Serrano. So mind you, sorry, uh, I'm um, not as well versed with uh, archaeology, so mind me if I butchered some of those um, uh, names, but um, overall just a very very warm welcome. And uh, with no further ado, we, op we open up the mic, we pass on the mic to Dr. Ruben G. Mendoza. Gracias. Uh, buenas noches todos. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, from all of you, and uh, in particular from uh, Vanessa Falcón Horta and also um, Gina Germina Nunez, uh, known as Gina uh, in my time, associated with her as one of my students as well as one of our colleagues at the California State University at Monterey Bay. I wanted to say a, a couple of things before I move forward with Aztec studies, because um, like so many things in my life, uh, whether you want to call me ADHD or you know, an individual with uh, tendencies towards uh, hyperactivity disorder, the reality is since I was 12 years old, I have been obsessed with the Aztec. Uh, when I was uh, quite young, I, used to, I learned uh, the Nahuatl language, which is now very much part of my past, and I would uh, say prayers in Nahuatl and I would pray to pre-Columbian uh, deities. So it made me kind of a weird high school kid. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I construed myself as a neo-Mexica, someone who believed that these were my ancestors and that uh, that inheritance was significant to me. So even though I've moved into a host of different areas, I've published on ancient Peru, I published on Mexico and Central America, the US Southwest. Uh, my heart has always been with the indigenous communities of the Americas. I am of uh, Yaqui Indian descent. These were peoples that interacted with the Kumeyaay and in fact are now purported to have had a leader 
who led the revolt against the Spanish at that time, who was of Yaqui Indian origin. Uh, since age 12, uh, I developed an obsession with the Aztecs, but for me, I wasn't interested in the violence. I wasn't interested in ritual sacrifice or any of those dimensions. I was interested in their art and poetry. And that gave me the inspiration to push through a school which was absolutely dysfunctional in Bakersfield, California. Uh, you know, there were weekly riots. There was everything imaginable that could go wrong. And I got caught up in it. And eventually I did graduate. I graduated early and managed to get to the California State University at Bakersfield. Uh, as a result, uh, I went on to complete my bachelor's and then went off to the University of Arizona. Uh, let's just say in a lot of, uh, uh, beyond my undergraduate studies, I didn't have much of a warm welcome at the University of Arizona or in my first uh, professorial role at the University of Colorado, in large part because of my studies of the uh, La Mexicanidad, our Mexican origins, or what I think of as the Mexican diaspora. In fact, the article that I sent out, one of them, uh, which deals with the turquoise corridor, is a validation and vindication for the fact that Mexicanos have crossed this border, uh, this so-called US border, as part of a continuous landscape for thousands of years. And that article attests to that. Um, while I'm an archaeologist, I can get away with talking about highly charged political issues without having to put them into contemporary terms, but still address the issues as I see fit. Uh, as a result of my studies in California, uh, right from the outset, I was invited by a priest to work at a California mission. And of course, um, my father didn't think much of the missions uh, or the Spanish and, and so on and so forth. And so I kind of took his tact and I became increasingly more engaged with the Aztecs as part of a rejection of Hispanidad. But in the course of my many years of traveling through Mexico, Central and South America, I came to see an equation between uh, pre-Columbian, for example, Mesoamerican, Aztec and other sites and the Catholic churches that stood near them. Clearly there were dimensions of colonialism and hybridity that I wanted to engage more fully. And so you could say I crossed the line to try to better understand who all our ancestors are. And uh, having grown up in uh, gang infested neighborhoods in Bakersfield, in fact, half my family were victims of gang related violence and drugs, uh, I decided I needed to find a way to reconcile who we are as a people. And we have Hispanic surnames. Uh, there are those of us who reject those names, but at the same time, I need to understand the broader legacy, whether it's Andalusian and Arabic or pre-Columbian, Mesoamerican and indigenous. And so for me, that's a validation for who I am as a person. And it has allowed me to strengthen my scholarship. So when I see things that I feel are an attack on our heritage, I'm able to respond in kind. And as Gina well knows, I don't hold back when it comes to the politics of identity, ethnicity, and all the other dimensions that we're associated with. For tonight, I thought what I would do is uh, take uh, a recent publication, actually it was a 1991 publication, uh, which actually treads into a very sensitive area of Mexican nationalism. Because for many years, uh, the so-called Aztec calendar or the sunstone has been seen as a national icon. Uh, for Mexicans, uh, just as the Mexican flag bears an image from the back of the Teocali de la Guerra Sagrada, or the Temple of the Sacred War, or simply the Temple Stone, the image that is at the very center of the Mexican flag has an eagle perched atop a, a nopal cactus holding a serpent in its tongue. When you look at the back of the Temple Stone, what that eagle is actually holding, and that monument dates to 1507, before the arrival of the Spanish, it is holding the symbol of the Atl Tlachinoli, fire and water, or the holy war. And of course, for Mexican nationalism, it's been converted into a serpent with consonant meanings. What I'll do tonight is I'll address the Aztec sunstone. And without further ado, I will bring up the PowerPoint so you can appreciate, if nothing else, the imagery that is associated with this monumental stone, which I've reinterpreted in terms of multiple dimensions. Not only do I attempt to vindicate Moctezuma Xocoyotzin, who has often been portrayed as a patsy of the Spaniards and Cortes in particular, but he was in fact one of the people 
who built some of the greatest monuments of Mexico Tenochtitlan, and he had the wherewithal and the forces and power to do so. But he was also someone uh, who was closely identified with Mexica cosmology, uh, the innermost core of Aztec belief, and it is represented in all the great monuments that he created. And that's what I hope to convey. Another part of it is scholars are still debating the date or age of the sunstone. And I believe that I've come to a, a fairly decisive conclusion that it was constructed in 1507 to commemorate the final or the very last Shumolpili or new fire ceremony ever conducted under the Aztec empire. Uh, those two pieces are significant because anything you read today will make clear that many scholars are still uh, confounded by the interpretation of this monument. So let me show the images and I'll share the screen now. I take it you can all see the uh, first PowerPoint slide. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I've uh, opted to uh, call this the night of the ninth sun, the Aztec sunstone in light of the commemoration of the new fire ceremony of AD 1507. The three images that you're looking at are central to the main theme that I now identify with the sunstone. And uh, in fact, the codex that you see to your left uh, is known as the Borgia Codex because of a, uh, a European religious who basically, uh, took, basically became the caretaker of that manuscript. Uh, but interestingly, the full title of the manuscript included the name Yowali Ehekatl, which means the uh, dark winds. Uh, and that's significant for the individual you see portrayed on the left. He is, in effect, uh, a, a incarnation of the sun that you're looking at at the center of the Aztec sunstone, except you see nine supernaturals, uh, various deities with deck battle or flint knives, literally extracting hearts and blood and light from the body of the blackened sun, who is the dark sun or the ninth sun or sol nueve as he was called in the Borgia insofar as later references. The image on the right depicts uh, from the murals of Desiderio Xocoyotzin, uh, the image of the new fire ceremony that was convened every 52 years throughout the course of the Aztec empire. Uh, and I have much more to say about that, but I'll leave that as that. This is a quote from a publication I published in Germany as a result of a talk uh, in Halle, Germany. I was invited there, I've been invited there three times to speak on topics related to ancient Mexico. And each time I was asked for a specific theme or topic, I came up with an idea and then I presented it. And that's how this paper came to be. Uh, in the 2021 paper, I say the following. <clears throat> the Aztec sunstone or calendar stone was originally situated before the Templo Mayor. And shortly after the fall of the Aztec capital of Mexico Tenochtitlan in 1521, was moved to the southeast corner of the present-day Zócalo. On the orders of Archbishop Fray Alonso de Montufar, the monument was dislodged and buried upside down as it, was, as it was thought to have inspired a resurgence of violence in that locality. On 17 December 1790, the monument was rediscovered and disinterred and relocated at the west elevation of the southwest bell tower of the Metropolitan Cathedral. And in short, the monument has gotten around the Socalo and has been known since the period of the conquest, but disappeared as a result of its burial. And then it was resurrected on 17th of December, 1790. This massive monument that I hear referred to as the Sunstone is one that has a, a wealth of iconography. And in examining this, I might note that I was asked if I could write a paper that addressed the so-called Aztec calendar for a volume. And I, I, hold it, uh, I hold it up here for those of you that can see. This volume was published in, in basically uh, 2021. And uh, it has a host of about 40 scholars, 
all of whom were invited to Halle to present, my idea of the intersection of power, cosmology, and time was a stone. And that was the theme of the conference. At the center, you see what has been traditionally interpreted as Tonatiu, the uh, sun of midday. Uh, and I would argue that it is actually the sun of midnight and is represented in the Codex Borgia as Sol Nueve or Nine Sun, the ninth sun. You see various world ages represented by jaguars, winds, uh, waters, and fire. And then on the outer rim, you see the Tonal Powali symbols identified with the days of the calendar and the 20 day month. However, the image is reversed and the symbols of the day are moving counterclockwise. So in other words, they're not following their general course. And I'll explain more details about this in a second. This is a photo in my personal library. It's actually one that's on a glass plate slide that had been hand tinted. And you see here the massive stone in relationship to the people standing about it. And here, uh, this particular photo dates to 1885. And uh, again, uh, during the American invasion of Mexico City in 1846, 1848, uh, they actually used it for target practice. And despite all of that, it has survived the weathering of time and the destructive nature of humans. For many years, uh, one of the things that most inspired my scholarship was uh, from age 12 onward, as I'd already noted, I was obsessed with the Aztecs. I wanted to learn their poetry, their language, etc. But it wasn't until I was about 16 years old, where at the uh, uh, Kern County Library in Bakersfield, I found a book by Justino Fernandez. It was this massive tome uh, that dealt with the goddess Cuatlique, and it was entirely in Spanish. And I might note that while I could speak a little bit of Spanish, I definitely did not uh, know how to read Spanish. And I used that book as a way to learn, going through this academic text to learn the language in a time when I was a jardinero, I was a gardener on the streets of Bakersfield. And during the summers, I picked grapes and various fruits and vegetables in the fields. And so let's just say I had my challenges to deal with. And so education was not high on my priority list, but this goddess really brought to life my curiosity about the Aztec civilization, its cosmology and its sophistication and complexity. Here we see a goddess who has been decapitated from her neck sprout two coral serpents to form blood. You note that she has 13 trellises of flesh hanging from her back as well as a decapitated cranium tied together with a skirt of serpents. She is the mother of the gods and the goddess of the universe. And in recent scholarship, she has been interpreted to be an animated dress. So she is an embodiment of a dress, feminine power embodied as this, if you will, monstrous serpentine creature. My first uh, studies, I, I, at about 16 or 17 years of age, I became fascinated with this site. And after, let's just say, uh, several bouts with gang problems in high school, uh, mainly cowboys and other uh, groups, uh, I finally uh, decided I needed to get out of that high school or I wasn't going to survive. And I graduated early. And in uh, basically my first month away from high school, I basically um, decided to go to Mexico to see this site and to see the monument of the goddess Cuatlique. And that was the beginning of many journeys into Mexico that I considered vision quests. For me, uh, it didn't matter if I didn't come back. What mattered was that I could be a part of these grandiose ancestors and their civilizations. Uh, this site completely absorbed me in the cosmology and belief of the Aztecs. It is a monument that I later published at the age of 18. Uh, and of course, I didn't win the undergraduate scholarship because they didn't know what I was talking about. I was talking cosmology at Cal State Bakersfield and they didn't have anybody to review my manuscript. But I did win a national graduate student competition with the, basically the same paper. And, uh, and uh, it was an embarrassment to Cal State Bakersfield faculty who had voted against my proposal. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, to boast, I'm saying that as a lesson uh, when it comes to the things that you care about, 
if you stay on track with those, uh, they're going to bear fruit. This ultimately led to a talk in Paris. I was invited by the noted ethno historian, Wigberto Jimenez Moreno, uh, to attend. And I told him, I don't know how to be narrow. I, I drive around a truck with forks, shovels, and rakes. I, I don't have that kind of money. And I managed to get there. I worked all summer, managed to get the money together. And I spoke at the University of the Sorbonne uh, at the age of 19 to present this idea related to the cosmology of the temple. So let's just say that this temple inspired my understandings of how monuments could incorporate multiple details uh, such that it really explicated the cosmology or the cosmos of an ancient people. Here we have the incarnation of the sun in various manifestations as the underworld jaguar sun and the three suns that basically represent the morning or the dawning, the, uh, the zenith, and of course, the sunset. In examining the so-called sunstone, there have been many studies beginning in 1790, and there are hundreds and hundreds of these, and they all have radically different interpretations of the meaning of the sunstone. Here we see one of the earliest such studies that was done in an effort to represent this monument. Uh, in this particular case, Antonio de Leon y Gama in their Descripción Histórica y Cronológica de las Dos Piedras que con ocasión del Nuevo Empedrado uh, que se está formando en la Plaza Principal de México. In 1790, they interpreted the monument more or less correctly as having uh, symbols identified with the Nahua, Mexica, or Aztec calendar, known as the Tonalpohuali. So when we get to the sunstone, what are we looking at here? You look at the, the uh, many details that you see here. And uh, again, you have what has been called Donatu, the midday sun. But what I found from examining the Borgia Codex was that the very symbols around the face that everybody debates are represented on Sol Nueve, the ninth sun. And ironically, in uh, various other manuscripts and codices, uh, you have representations identified directly with the Shumolpili or new fire ceremony of 1507, and the iconography is virtually identical. When we talk about the Aztecs, uh, you know, I don't need to belabor the evidence or the ethno histories, uh, archaeological or otherwise, that bear on Aztec ritual sacrifice. Uh, I have a book forthcoming on that very topic. Uh, a number of my former students are involved in that book, and uh, it bears upon uh, the religious, ritual, and cosmological significance of blood. Uh, among the Maya, it was known as chulel, which was a, a, a cosmic substance that animates all things. There are no things in this world that are not part of that essence. Everything that manifests before us, interestingly enough, manifest by virtue of the light of the sun. So when you think of it that way, our ancestors did in fact have a firm grasp on what it meant to link blood to the cosmos. It is integral to that cosmos. Here, a ceremony that has been used as a way of explaining the sunstone because there were other stones, the Temalacatl, for example, this one would have been one in which a warrior went to his death by virtue of fighting at least five Mexica or Tlaxcaltecan warriors. Again, Desiderio Hernández Chocoyotzin painted these incredible murals in the city of Tlaxcala. And if you ever get a chance to see them, I would argue that they are every bit as imposing and uh, sumptuous as those of uh, Diego Rivera and his associates. So when we look at the sunstone, there have been a number of reconstructions, but uh, this is probably one of the closest representations of what the sunstone looked like with its polychromy, in other words, its paint. And you'll note that the colors red and turquoise, as well as a darker blue, in fact, we think this might have been painted black. Interestingly, one would think that a sun of midday or tonatiu would be painted in the light of the sun, in other words, yellow, uh, in, as, as, as though it were gold. In fact, that association has been made many times. But this, these are the colors of the monument as represented uh, by, you know, essentially in the work of uh, Victor Manuel Maldonado. 
In my study, uh, which I conducted in the early part of uh, 2021 under deadline, uh, I began to see associations of the sunstone with these uh, basically ball court hoops that are found throughout Mesoamerica. And although they're not clear here, you can see that uh, these hoop stones would have been placed in the sides of the ball court, and each of them has solar rays sticking out of them, uh, such as this one here. And I had to ask myself, what is the association? Since from my early youth, I've often heard scholars say, oh, well, the ball game represented the transit of the sun through you know, midday and the zenith passage, et cetera. And so that has always been with me. And finally, I took uh, the, uh, the, the temple stone, which has a representation of this monument at the top. In fact, this is not the complete. I cut the center out where it was able to be cut out. And I realized that I was looking at a ball court hoop. So what I'm saying and on one level is that the sun, the sun of darkness or nine sun, Sol Nueve, is emerging from the underworld through this ball court hoop symbolized with fire and turquoise. And I might note that turquoise in the pre-Columbian world of Mesoamerica signified fire and light. How far can we take this iconography back? Well, one of my initial insp inspirations uh, for my studies of the Aztec was a visit at age 12 to the site of Teotihuacan. I've since published on that site. My dissertation concerns the collapse of that site and the parties that were involved. And in looking at the monuments of Teotihuacan, such as this one, I now realize that the legends of the self-sacrifice of, of the gods at Teotihuacan jumping into a pit of fire only to emerge as the sun uh, has, primordial, uh, has a primordial essence that links itself to all of the cosmological beliefs that would ultimately be inherited by the Aztecs not the least of which is the dead sun, or Sol Nueve, which emerges from death from the underworld and out of a, a cauldron of fire. This monument I now see as that, and though I may not be able to prove it, I think it's pretty clear from recent interpretations of Teotihuacan, a, a, a Mexican scholar has now found documentation in the codices that it wasn't Teotihuacan, the place where men become gods, it was Teo, Teowacan, in other words, the place of the sun. So when I move back to the question of this monument, I, let's see, let me close this. When I move back to the question of the sun, there have been, there's been a lot of speculation that goes well beyond the central theme of the sun in the midst of this ring of calendrical dates. You also have these packed stone areas all along the perimeter of the sun. In addition, you have these larger holes that will become central to what I'm gonna talk about. You know, much of the stone was broken and shattered, but there are eight of these all around the perimeter. And I was grappling with what they signified. Uh, people like Anthony Avini, a uh, noted archeoastronomer, believes that these are constellations, but hasn't been able to finalize it because they, don't they are not shaped like any constellations. And so I discarded that idea and I began to realize that if this is in fact a sunstone in which the central elements are all related to turquoise and fire, that these may well be areas where they were attempting to kindle the new fire with a fire drill. And the fire drill basically left these uh, perforations uh, all around the perimeter of the monument. When we go to Mexico Tenochtitlan, we are clearly dealing with a society which was highly sophisticated. Its populations ran into the hundreds of thousands, uh, well over 200,000 to 250,000, not to mention the 3 million people who lived around the perimeter of the island. The reality is, is that one of the symbols that was used in the lords, among the lords and ladies of Mexico Tenochtitlan was the use of turquoise. And here Diego Rivera notes uh, basically the crown that was worn by the most noble of lords, here uh, a judge in the marketplace. 
We also see the relationship in the Aztec sunstone of the Xiuacuatl, which are the fire serpents, which are actually depicted uh, as formed of turquoise, again, a symbol for fire. You also see this stellar crest, which represents the Pleiades, according to most interpretations. And of course, uh, also in one of my views of it, the so-called snout, which is what this is, is a form of the Sitlal Shonequili, or blue worm, that also signified Canis Major and or the Pleiades. So the fire serpent, again, remember this, it is central to the Aztec sunstone, but why? Another uh, task I had to uh, uh, really interrogate in order to get at the, this new interpretation of the sunstone was nobody has been able to uh, uh, identify who these two deities are that are emerging from the mouths of the fire serpents uh, or the, the, the turquoise fire serpents, I should say. This one, people have speculated because it has a crosshatch face, uh, likely signifies Shitakutli, uh, the Lord of Turquoise, the Lord of Fire. And that makes sense within the context. But this figure really did not have an identification until I began looking at other monuments that have been provisionally dated to 1507. And I have since, and I'll just go ahead and you know, uh, uh, spill the beans here before I get to the point, is I've identified this as Tlahuiscalpantecutli, uh, the Lord of Dawn, the planet Venus. So we've come this far. I've identified some of the significance of turquoise. But one of the most significant pieces, and I talk about this at some length in my uh, turquoise quarter paper. That's part of the reason I sent it along with the Aztec sunstone paper. Uh, that one is coming out with Cambridge University uh, this month, actually. Uh, I just haven't received a copy of the book. Uh, I did send along a copy of the uh, proof paper. Uh, which has all the images. But here you see Netzawalpili uh, or Netzawalpilitsin uh, wearing a turquoise uh, robe. There have been efforts by other scholars over the years to claim that this is tie dye. I don't believe that for a minute because there are other scholars who have done very thoroughgoing studies of the clothing and attire of the, the lords and ladies of Tenochtitlan. And it's clear that they wore a garment that was, in fact, the turquoise knotted tied cape and border of eyes. Uh, this uh, this uh, piece known as a Xiutlalpili Tilmatli Tenisho is the turquoise knotted cape. And the significance of it is that each of the Aztec lords and ladies and the emperor in particular were identified as sun-faced lords or incarnations of the current sun. Uh, this would have been the fifth son in the time of Moctezuma. Uh, it makes sense that they would wear a turquoise diadem on their head, and if in fact they represented embodiments of turquoise and fire and light. Here in the British Museum, I've had the opportunity to photograph a number of these pieces, as well as those that are in other museums throughout Mexico and Central America. And this piece in particular interests me, uh, because it represents uh, the turquoise lord, the fire guide, or Xiutecutli, uh, who is here represented entirely composed of turquoise tesserae, which was a technology developed under Teotihuacan just prior to the collapse of that city in the mid sixth century. But here the turquoise is inlaid. Uh, the resins that were used were enough to adhere all the pieces onto these finely carved uh, uh, pieces that were used for burials and to represent fallen lords. I call this the semiosteographic system, a term borrowed from a scholar who uh, felt the need to identify constellations of individual elements having individual meanings, but when all seen and interpreted together, they have a much larger meaning. Uh, meaning. In other words, a cosmology or a cosmos, the way of the order of the world. When I go back, and this is something else I bring up in the turquoise quarter paper that I sent you, uh, here we have an Olmecoid jadeite mask. It's, I would prefer to call it a greenstone mask since it hasn't been identified as to uh, whether it's true jade, nephrite, or another type. Here next to it, you see the uh, turquoise mask I showed you. 
again, in ancient Mesoamerica, when Teotihuacan was running the show, it had sent soldiers into Tikal, otherwise known as Motul, if we want to get that right. Uh, if it were to have been sighted in uh, Wakanda forever, I would have been concerned if they called it Tikal. It was Motul, the seat of empire. Uh, here we see the turquoise lord, uh, Shutukutli, and then we see an earth lord from a much earlier period. In Teotihuacan's beginnings, it was interacting extensively with the Maya. That's the subject of my dissertation. My professors did not want to buy into that. They were Mayanists, and they didn't want no Mexicans in their neighborhood. And so I fought against that, got me in a lot of trouble, but I believed that I was on the right track. And now we actually have evidence in Teotihuacan of buried Maya lords under the temple of Quetzalcoatl in, in the pyramid of the moon, and then in an entire barrio that's been discovered that was in fact destroyed in the fourth century. So that connection is very real. Here uh, in the beginning, when things were more peaceable between Teotihuacan and the Maya, uh, they were using jade in Teotihuacan. But at about the beginnings of the sixth century, we see a disruption of the Teotihuacanos in the Maya region. They are ousted from uh, Tikal and their monuments are smashed. And interestingly enough, shortly thereafter, the Teotihuacanos are exploiting turquoise in the far north and beginning exchange with the peoples of the Southwest, uh, mainly Arizona. And later uh, groups like the Toltecs were interacting with uh, the peoples of Chaco Canyon. Uh, the uh, chemistry of turquoise has borne that out. So that is in fact, uh, now validated, along with the presence of cacao, chocolate, uh, macaws or parrots, and other creatures and copper works in Chaco Canyon, coming out of West Mexico, the Guasave Sinaloa area. The temple stone that I keep mentioning is this one. And you see that sunstone represented at the top. On each side of this sunstone, there is an incarnation of, uh, of Moctezuma Shikoyotzin, the last Moctezuma, basically in the clothing of Xolotl, uh, or one of the peoples of the north, the Chichimeca, uh, who were the people of the dog lineage, uh, the barbarians, if you will, that the Aztecs identified with. And on the other side, we have a representation of Tawiscal Pantecutli, but with elements of Tezcatlipoca uh, born in. So much of the iconography and the symbolism, for example, the smoking mirror or the smoke mirror, and the atl tlachinoli, or symbol of water here and fire here, were sacred elements that found their way into drums, such as this one, between uh, you know, eagles literally uh, uh, basically fighting one another. And, and that fire and that, uh, that dynamism is represented by the atl tlachinoli. One of the things I wanted to say, because I'm going to try to pull all this together, and I know it's a bit complex is that the tech bottle or flint knives uh, were being used for human sacrifice, but they were also animated. Uh, they became anthropomorphs when they were deposited as supernatural beings into the corpus of the great temple. Here we see one it, that is spouting water and fire, you know, in other words, a symbol of the holy war and has the icon of Tezcatlipoca, the invisible one who appears uh, throughout uh, many of the codices in various forms. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to uh, advance is that the tech bottle among the Maya and many Mesoamerican peoples were believed to have formed when lightning struck the earth. And they would go to those places to look for the flint, or I should say the chert more accurately, in order to produce the knives that would then be used as symbols and as instruments for sacrifice. So think of them as lightning bolts. Another item that factors into the interpretation of the sunstone uh, is essentially the sacatapoyoli here, the grass ball of sacrifice. You see it represented here in a monument dated provisionally to 1507 as well. All these monuments appear at about the same time. And you see the spines of the agave cactus sticking out here. Well, these were used by priests and the lords to give blood sacrifice, auto sacrifice. They would basically run them through their thighs, through their ears, through their tongues, and through their arms. And there's many depictions of this. But what became of the bloodied uh, agave thorns or the maguey thorns? Well, they would insert them into these grass balls that would then be burned. So again, another element that factors into the sunstone. 
And these skulls that we see uh, from throughout Mesoamerica, I identify by virtue of the turquoise embedded in their, their you know, the, the bony structures of the face. I believe that these are the sun-faced lords or the fire-born lords of Mesoamerica. In other words, these were the caciques who, when buried, would then be recovered and their skulls would be curated as these turquoise balls of fire. Other more ornate images, for example, this one shows a turquoise fire serpent like that, that you know, circum, you know, circumscribes the Aztec calendar stone or sunstone. Here, uh, they, they're made entirely of turquoise. The turquoise has been basically chemically studied uh, for its origins and it's been identified with the American Southwest. So the connection between what is now the United States and what was the empire of the Aztec or Mexica is very clear cut. So I move back to this image that I mentioned before. I don't know if my, uh, uh, what is it? Let me move this. This image shows Sol Nueve from the Codex Borgia uh, sections 39 and 40. And it identifies as Yohualtecutli, the Lord of Night, or Sol Nueve, Nine Sun. Uh, you see nine deities here, 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 and on around, literally brandishing deck bottle or lightning bolts, if you will. And they are literally sacrificing or cutting into the sun. And as they cut into the sun to remove nine hearts representing this one being, nine hearts are extracted. The blood of this being exudes or literally gushes from nine wounds, including the neck. And because it is the sun, out of the blood emerges light. And that's literally what you're seeing in each of these images, including this one at the center, where this being cuts into the body, the heart is being extracted, and it produces light. Uh, I once got myself in trouble in Denver, Colorado, when I gave a presentation to a public audience at the Denver Museum of Natural History. And I just said, well, it kind of reminds me of tax time and the IRS comes after us. Well, there happened to be an IRS agent in the audience who took great offense to that. And I started getting hang up phone calls, harassment and threats of being audited uh, until I managed to track down her boss and then it all stopped. But anyway, that's an aside. But again, Sol Nueve is central to the icon iconography of what I deem to be the representation of the sunstone. And there is a description uh, in uh, the Borgia Codex that talks about this sun being sacrificed in a courtyard in which there are images of the Tonal Powali running around the entire perimeter. And you literally see them right here, even though they're heavily degraded. This matches a courtyard that was right next to the great temple of the Aztecs in Mexico Tenochtitlan. So I believe this manuscript, even though scholars have not made a definitive assessment of the age, they say it possibly dates from the, uh, the 12th through the fifth, uh, uh, 16th century, actually. And more of them are aligning around the idea that this manuscript was painted right before the conquest, which I believe would put it right around 1507 and the new fire ceremony of that year, which coincided with the summer solstice, which would have been a particularly malevolent, malevolent moment in the history of the Aztec Empire. Other beings, and, and this is an association with the Xiumolpili, uh, uh, the new fire ceremony. It was believed in, in the cycles of the cosmology of the Aztecs is that every 15 to every 15 two year, every, every 52 years, uh, there would be a kind of a ripple in, this, in, the, in the cosmic landscape, which could open a portal to the destruction of the world as the Aztecs saw it. And this was a, a, a period of absolute terror for the Aztec people, including Moctezuma Shukoyotzin. The proper acknowledgement and ceremonies and blood sacrifice was needed to make this moment one in which the uh, Mexica and the Nahua peoples could prevail. Because it was believed that these star demons uh, and the Lord Tlaltecutli would open up and that the star demons would come down and they would literally incinerate and consume the people of the planet. 
And so here's a representation of the Lord Tlaltecutli, uh, who was an incarnation of Siwakwatl, or the snake woman, who I might note was an androgynous being. And these androgynous beings were central to Aztec cosmology. One other point of fact, and again, bear in mind that I was grappling with a monument that I had grown up with and that I absolutely admired. In fact, I had, um, when, my, when I was in high school, my parents would go to the border, we, uh, down to Tijuana, we'd take clothes to the people that lived in Cartolandia, and we continued to do that until it started getting dangerous because people were so desperate uh, for anything that they could use to feed themselves. And uh, anyway, we brought back a plaster cast of pre-Columbian monuments. I would paint them and my parents would sell them so we could make a living. And uh, I then began producing my own versions of pre-Columbian monuments and, and trying to make them as authentic as possible. Well, one of those was a giant Aztec sunstone. And I had been painting it. I had spent, I don't know how many months painting it. And because I worked with my father, my dad was, let's just say he wasn't all there. Uh, he still is, and if he's still alive, and uh, he would get violent. And one day uh, he got upset with me, told me that I needed to get the hell out of the truck and walk home. And I walked miles to get home. And this happened frequently. If I didn't work fast enough in the, in the Bakersfield sun, uh, I was doomed for that day. Well, I got home and my father had taken this large uh, uh, plaster cast. It was probably four feet, maybe five feet across. It was almost finished and he smashed it. And I proceeded to smash all the rest of the artwork I had. Uh, because I decided uh, this was not going to be my life. And uh, so ironically, here I am back all these years later, resurrecting the cosmology of the Aztec sunstone. And this document opened up to me, the Codex Borbonicus literally is a manuscript devoted to the new fire ceremony of 1507. And in the process of examining it in relationship to my theory that the sunstone was actually a commemorative monument to the new fire ceremony, I found this image. And this image emulates the two figures at the bottom of the Aztec sunstone. On, on the one side, uh, you have the Lord of Dawn, Tlahuiscal Pantecutli here, and you can always tell them by these star patterns around the eyes. And, and then on this side, Shutecutli with the fire serpent perched up on, on his back. And this literally was a symbol, along with all the turquoise crowns that are linked in for this period during which the new fire ceremony of 1507 during the winter solstice convened and brought great terror to the people of Mexico Tenochtitlan. And it was by virtue of this, I realized what they had done was reverse the images because the images on the Tonal Bowali are similarly reversed. So in other words, we're looking at cosmic time and time in reverse in a darkened sun in a place of the dark winds. This was an image that I commissioned one of my students to create. Uh, admittedly, it was inspired by one that's uh, on, the, on the back of my watch, actually. I, I purchased uh, the casing uh, on, on the internet. And I said, can you produce an image that approximates the, the, the depth of this image? And she did, I feel she did. And you again see some of the details that again are reasserted, not only there, but in the image of Nine Sun from the Codex Borgia. When you look at it, this is our recreation of the colors. And what I'm arguing is that we are dealing with the, the uh, Yawal Tecutli, the Lord of Night, as the sun, the sun of darkness, the ninth sun, Sol Nueve, emerging from an underworld. And he is literally. Uh, uh, represented by these four panels, which uh, admittedly are the symbols of the four previous world ages. But based on my studies of Teotihuacan, I realized that this forms the butterfly, the obsidian butterfly uh, that is, was so revered by both the Aztecs and previously by the peoples of Teotihuacan and was central to the ancient fire ceremony. So if you can re-visualize this as literally Sol Nueve, the ninth sun, emerging from the underworld as the obsidian butterfly, having androgynous features, both male and female, which have totally perplexed the scholarly world. So it is emerging from the underworld and its face is dark blue or black. It has a lightning bolt emerging from its mouth in the form of the tech bottle flint blade. It has 
this image, which is what appears to be a crown, uh, and at the bottom, the bottom of what is essentially an agave thorn sticking into the sakatepoi or the grass ball of sacrifice. And you might say, well, God, that's quite a leap. Well, if you look carefully around this entire sunstone, here's another agave thorn sticking into the monument, another one here, another one here, and another one here. There are uh, nine of those total. You're saying, well, I only see eight. Well, the ninth one is right here, right at the middle. So this is, again, a validation in my mind that this is Sol Nueve, the ninth sun of darkness. Uh, also, in this, you see these additional rays. Guess how many of those there are? There are nine. So the number nine recurs repeatedly throughout this monument. Again, among the Aztecs, the number nine was identified with the underworld and Mictlan. And so I see this all as this cosmology interlinked. You have two fire serpents. If you can imagine it as though they were animated, uh, you know, uh, maybe in the metaverse, they can be animated someday, where these serpents are literally undulating and circling uh, the sun as it emerges from the underworld through a giant ball court ring. And out of it, you see the, the sacrificial thorns uh, or, and they could be deer metapodial, also used for bloodletting, stuck into the center as though this was the grass ball of sacrifice and the sun is literally bursting into flame, emerging from the underworld of darkness and the dead and lighting the new cosmos for the next 52 years. So at the bottom of the monument, you have again, Xiutakutli, uh, the turquoise lord of fire, and Tlahuiscalpantecutli, the lord of dawn, who hearkened to the emergence of the night sun into the world of the living. And just to uh, minimize to some extent the importance of the new fire ceremony for the 52 year cycle, while I was doing my research, I began to realize that the new fire ceremonies were conducted throughout Mesoamerica for the inauguration of kings, the dedication of temples. So there were many minor ceremonies that were done, but the 52 year cycle was the one in which the great fire ceremonies were conducted. And these were conducted on a hill known as Cerro de la Estrella. And I was up there when I was 17. Uh, there are many caves up there. There's an ancient Toltec uh, a temple up there. And it was there that they would conduct the fire ceremony. And in so doing, uh, the fire ceremony began with all these lords and ladies carrying bundles of fire sticks. But before they set the torch, they would sacrifice a war captive. And after they had extracted the heart, they would take a plank of wood, place it over the chest, uh, the gaping hole in the chest, and they would kindle a fire. It would literally uh, uh, ignite. And they then would each come and light their torches and runners would carry the torches to all parts of the city, all 19 major temples. And these would all be lit and it would relight the entirety of the city. That's how significant this moment was. And you see, Chichimecas down here, literally with their own version of the fire ceremony inside of a cave. Uh, these are uh, just uh, some preliminary, oops, uh, let me go back. Uh, these are some preliminary representations of what I'm trying to convey. Uh, Yoaltecutli, uh, the, the, basically here is the agave thorn at the center that forms the centerpiece. And then you have the agave thorns that run around the entire perimeter here. And so again, the agave thorns identified you with Yoaltecutli, the turquoise emblems identified here, but with the exception that the fire serpents are also turquoise. Around this, you also note the number of uh, holes. I now believe, and this would have to be demonstrated by virtue of a, a blood residue analysis, as well as a carbon testing of the monument. I believe each of these cupules were used for burning the sacatepoi, the grass balls of sacrifice. And can you imagine, while this thing lay flat and the ceremonies were conducted and the blood was let, uh, they would then take the blood of the lords and ladies of Tenochtitlan, and each of these would be placed in nine positions on the face of the ninth sun, and they would be ignited. And so that may explain some of the burn patterns on the monument. 
And again, I, I bring you another close-up here. We have Tlahuiscal Pantecutli, the Lord uh, Dawn, uh, literally the planet Venus, next to the emergent fifth sun, and of course, and the butterfly, as I call it, in the middle, uh, really a year sign. Uh, uh, and, and others have interpreted this as the twisted chords, the Malinali, and I'm in accord with that. But bear in mind that whenever we look at Aztec symbols or Mexica or Mesoamerican or New World, uh, Peruvian pre-Columbian symbolism, there's a tendency for those of us who have been born of the Eurocentric school of thought to see things as only one thing. And in the pre-Columbian and indigenous worlds, all of these things were hybrid, just like we as mestizos are hybrid. That was the source of cosmic energy. All things were interrelated. And if our world could understand that, we might see each other differently. But in the pre-Columbian world, one being could manifest as multiple beings. And I believe that that's what was going on in this monument and others. So finally, when I look at the new fire ceremony, this is again a close up of the lighting and kindling of the new fire uh, before the great temple. And uh, here you see uh, what appears to be an animal actually being sacrificed in Tlaxcala, as opposed to Mexico Tenochtitlan. And then this is a representation uh, from the Codex Borbonicas. Uh, and it is this manuscript that actually foretells or tells the story of the new fire ceremony of 5th, December 1507. And it goes into grand detail. And here you literally see the temple atop the mountain known as Cerro de la Estrella. And uh, this particular uh, monument is depicted with these star-like patterns. And I now believe those signify turquoise. Uh, and they do in other contexts, but the question is, do they also signify turquoise at the heart of Mexico Tenochtitlan? But you do see the firebox is literally, appears to be a box made of turquoise with circular rings at the bottom that represent that which is precious. You see each of these individuals uh, uh, approaching the temple and then literally kindling the fires that would be used to light the city and you see Huitzilopochtli from his temple overlooking the entire ceremony. And then off to the right, you see people wearing blue masks for their fear of what would transpire by midnight if the new fire failed to ignite. And you see uh, 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 women, for example, uh, feared uh, that if they were pregnant at the time of the new fire, that their children could be exposed to the star demons, the tzitzi nimia. Uh, who were these demons that approximate La Llorona, if you will. This is an example of one of the Shumolpili or the binding of the years bundles. And this one is the one that actually relates to the ceremony of 1507. More importantly, when we look at uh, the dynamism of the Mexica cosmos, we bear in mind that, you know, of course, one of the most uh, overwrought stories is that of you know, European perceptions of blood uh, letting in ancient Tenochtitlan. The reality is, is that it was part of a cosmological continuum. Uh, in my forthcoming book, uh, we've been able to trace examples of ritual bloodletting all the way back uh, to the archaic period to roughly six to 8,000 BC in Mexico and South America. Uh, so this wasn't something new. In the case of the Mexica, they elevated it to an all time, uh, uh, they, they magnified uh, the, the, uh, the mag well, the magnitude of the ritual was uh, rendered writ large on a scale well beyond anything that had ever come before. And I do believe, given that the Mexica were not welcome back into the Valley of Mexico and had to fight for every thing that they had, they became far more militarized in order to survive. And as a result, they used uh, uh, these uh, sacrificial ceremonies as rites of intensification, as a means by which to send messages to all the tributaries. In other words, we have the armies, we have the power, but if you cooperate with us, you will live in peace. If you don't, you will end up on the Sompantlis of Tenochtitlan or the skull racks. And it was uh, both a privilege and uh, an awkward moment for me to be invited since I published a paper on the Great Skull Rack uh, of Mexico Tenochtitlan in 2007. Well, uh, almost eight years later, they actually found it and 
my predictions about what it would look like, its scale, actually were found to be true. And uh, Raul Barrera invited me into the skull chamber and one of the towers of one of the earlier skull racks. And here in the lower left, you see just uh, at one of the walls, which is seven skulls thick, uh, and then the pit lined with skulls throughout. This is a reconstruction, uh, basically uh, redone by my student to represent what I believe these skull towers would have formed. And this is from a, an article done for uh, Nature uh, magazine, but we redid it so that I could show that recent discoveries show that the fire pits uh, or the pits of skulls may well have been used as fire pits. So again, uh, the idea of fire and birth, rebirth was central. And of course, this would have been the proximate dimensions of the skull rack currently under excavation in Mexico City. So when we look at the end of empire and we take into account the monument identified as the sunstone and the temple stone and a host of others that were all commissioned by Moctezuma Shakoyotzin for the 1507 new fire ceremony, it was clear that Moctezuma was in dread of what was coming and he was a very religious individual. He was essentially a priest who rose to power and he retained many of the fundamental elements of a cosmology that was shared by many world peoples. In fact, when the Franciscans arrived in the new world, their cosmology dictated that, and I realize that this is colonialism at, at its best, they came in believing that they needed to save all of the indigenous peoples of the new world lest their souls be lost. And it wasn't so much to save the Indians as it was to save themselves because they too believed that the apocalypse was at hand and the world would end and that they had to do what they could to save as much of humanity as they could. And while you might say, well, that's kind of a, a ignominious, a ignominious end. It is a kind of a, a, a false start because the indigenous peoples of the Americas did not need saving. Uh, but the friars believed the end of the world was imminent and hence their zealousness in the conversions and the brutality of the Spanish in many sectors of the new world. Here in a monument discovered uh, just recently in 2006, this is an image of the androgynous being known as Tlaltecutli. Uh, this is a massive structure uh, and uh, it shows literally the, the central portion of it was smashed by a column from a colonial building built right over this. But this was the sarcophagus lid of the Lord Aguishotl, who sent 20,000 war captives to their deaths over a four day period uh, in order, and I believe in order to vindicate the Mexica empire for its loss against the peoples uh, of what we today know as the Purepecha or the empire of Michoacan, where the Aztecs and their allies uh, ended up with 40,000 war dead. And uh, they could not come back from that. Awishotl comes to power and within 10 years, he holds this mass sacrifice. He dies and Moctezuma has all these monuments constructed to vindicate and to build on the idea that the fifth world was re renascent and that it would endure. And finally, the imagery of Hernan Cortez in the paintings of Diego Rivera uh, do hearken to the apocalypse that Moctezuma Xocoyotzin may have foreseen uh, because he had soothsayers, he had priests, he had prophets and others, and they were constantly looking into the future. And the Aztec sunstone, I believe, was just one of those many dimensions that defined what the Aztecs believed and the timing under which they believed it would transpire. And I close with that last image. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Dean Guillermina Gina Nunez and Dr. Vanessa Falcon Orta. I didn't have time to write all your names down. I, I was literally adding these uh, to an existing credit line. Uh, but some of these other individuals are people who I've worked with as a result of the publication of the paper uh, that I showed you earlier. I, I don't know where I'm at with time. I probably went over. Uh, I tend to talk a lot. But hopefully you get a sense that the so-called sunstone in my iteration interpretation is literally a monument dedicated to the last um, uh, fire ceremony convened under the Mexica or Aztec empire. And finally, probably most significantly, each Aztec emperor 
was seen as an incarnation of the sun. And so I don't think it's a, a, an accident that Moctezuma was the ninth Tlatuani or Lord of the Aztec empire. So he literally was Sol Nueve, the ninth Lord and an incarnation represented in the body of the Aztec sunstone. So thank you. Okay, Dr. Ruben Mendoza, um, here we have a round of applause virtually, as well as a round of applause for our audience um, in person. Well, thank you. <laughs> do, you do you have any questions? I realize that's a complex uh, presentation, and I can assure you, I have a lot less hair today than I did when I started this project, uh, only because uh, it uh, in, in going through it, I had to revisit a lot of my earlier research, even all the way back to my undergraduate studies. But uh, be assured that I understand uh, the Mexica and the Mesoamerican people uh, on a, a level that has occupied my life. And so when I visit Mexico, and I've visited virtually every state in my travels, I've uh, traveled the length and breadth with the idea of trying to understand who our people are. And when I study the United States, uh, I look at what I refer to as the Mexican diaspora. And you can imagine that when people say, oh, well, you know, go back to Mexico, or, and I've heard that, uh, my view is we have always been here and we always will be. <laughs> Did you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because the, the, the microphone's right here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, as a Chicanx, uh, I hate that religion of Aztecs is only associated to sacrifice when it's in reality, they celebrate life and death equally. For example, the god of Choplo, that is known as kind and loving, which is the god of the underworld. What do you have other other examples that? might agree with this statement or that can be shown that it's not only a religion of death or stuff like that? Well, I, I think that uh, the reality is, and I, I know we don't, uh, especially from our Western westernized views, uh, death is an ugly thing. And yet I don't see it that way. I embrace it myself. And I try to understand it through the fact that I have come to understand Aztec belief on a pretty profound level. And I think they have given me courage uh, to basically uh, live my life without fear. And I can assure you, I've been in many situations where that fear should have manifested. So that's one thing. And I do believe that with the Mexica, their way of life gave them heart. It gave them uh, the courage to face every imaginable uh, 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 conflict, every challenge. But you only need to go, for example, to the writings of Miguel Leon Portilla, those were really a source of validation for me when I was in high school. You know, I was at a Bakersfield High and it, I was constantly being picked on. I got beat up a couple of times. Uh, I fought back. I beat up a couple of people. Uh, my brothers and sisters ended up arrested because of the violence there. Uh, and, and I would spend my every lunch hour reading the poetry of the Mexica. And, and that for me was a validation of who I was as a Mexicano, a Chicano. Uh, it, it, uh, there are very powerful statements there. They don't exclude uh, bloodletting. Uh, they incorporated it into their beliefs in such a fashion that it's, it's like a, a Mexican blanket that has been woven intricately with many different colored threads and with the investment of one's soul and one's emotions and one's artistry and talents. It is an embodiment, it's an, a landscape but what many of us see is only one dimension when the artist invested themselves very thoroughly. And so I do believe that when you read the poetry of the Aztecs, and I'm not talking about uh, you know, the kind of thing oh, where they're talking about flowers. No, they're talking about courage. And if you read the statement made by the lords of Tenochtitlan to their Spanish oppressors, they basically say, if you are telling us that all that we valued that all that was valued by the Toltecs and all of our predecessors was false, then you might as well take our lives now. And so for me, that is the, the message that we should take, that the Mexica overcame uh, uh, some of the most incredible challenges 
to build an empire that would be felt across the entire landscape of Mesoamerica from the American Southwest all the way into Central America. Uh, they were, if you read uh, the works of uh, uh, um, Ortiz de Montellano on Aztec medicine, it is clear that the Aztecs produced some of the most sophisticated medical traditions uh, that the world has ever known. Uh, these were traditions uh, from the intramedular nail to a whole host of uh, medic, uh, medical treatments uh, and surgeries that were undertaken such that uh, literally the Spanish began adopting some of their methods. Uh, same thing happened in South America and I published on medical traditions in both regions. So I'm saying that when we focus on one dimension, for example, if we were to take uh, the American empire, because this is an empire in case we hadn't noticed, the reality is, is if we were to focus on the My Lai massacre, uh, we would have a very distorted picture of who we are as Americans. But that's not to say that we haven't engaged in atrocities at all levels of analysis, we have. And of course, people in you know, Florida and Texas are now trying to banish all the negativity because they think it's divisive and disruptive. Well, we didn't bring it to the table, it was brought to us. And the reality is, is that slavery uh, has existed in many forms, in many cultures, as has ritual violence and warfare. Uh, the world has not been without war for any more than maybe 30, and for recorded history, for any more than 30 to 60 years. Most of the rest of it has been dominated by war in one place or another. So what I would say, and I see, and I know this sounds crazy, but I mentioned this to a colleague today who was distraught over an issue. And I said, if you look at the world as an illusion and you weave into it the pieces that you want to see in your own life and you uh, visualize your future in a particular way, then you will live the life that you value and many of the things that some will exacerbate or hold high like violence or guns or other dimensions of the human condition, then those will dominate you as opposed to those dimensions you wanna see. And I do believe that the Shikanex uh, concept allows for the belief that we as a people can be united and we can see the future together and that that, that place can be positive for our youth. It may not always be without conflict, but it can be without violence. Thank you. I have a question. Okay. Um, I have heard that there are maps that say that Utah, it was the old home of the Aztecs. Is there any information saying this is true? Well, I, I wrote a paper uh, and you're talking about Aslan uh, and the Aslanecas. Uh, Aslan, uh, I wrote this paper many years ago. Unfortunately, it didn't get published, uh, but I had scholars write me about the importance of it. Um, I, uh, I believe, based on the archaeology and the ethnohistory, uh, that the Mexica originated in the Valley of Mexico and that they were refugees from the collapse of Teotihuacan. And bear in mind, I spent many years studying Teotihuacan and the associated peoples. And interestingly, Edward Zeller, a German uh, um, ethno-historian from the late 1890s, early 1900s, he actually tracked the toponyms, every town that the Aztecs passed through, and they actually document that they came directly from the north, as has always been assumed. But many of us have said, oh no, it's got to be Mexcaltitlan uh, uh, in West Mexico, because it has an island, but there's no archaeological evidence there, and people continue to echo that idea. Uh, in uh, Utah, it's also been echoed there, but there was a time in the early 20th century where people believed uh, that uh, uh, the Aztecs originated in Newfoundland, uh, which is you know back way up into the Canadian area. Uh, there's no evidence of that either. Um, on the other hand, the archaeological, the linguistic, and even some of the genetic evidence seems to suggest that there's a melange of uh, people uh, interacting in northern Mexico. And from my perspective, there's a good body of evidence that the Mexica were actually Huastecized. In other words, they lived among the Huastecs during this peregrination to the north from the Valley of Mexico. And there they adopted Tamuanchan, which is a Huastec name for the land of flowers, which was believed to be the afterlife. Uh, they also adopted the clothing of the Huasteca 
the monuments of the Huasteca and even the architecture of the Huasteca. And like I said in my lecture at that time, I said, if it, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Uh, except that the movement to the north was among a people who spoke a Mayoid language. And the Aztecs actually adopted some of that terminology. The linguistics seems to uh, show that the Aztecs were from the areas uh, that encompass the Valley of Mexico and the area to the north. But we don't really have evidence taking it all the way into Utah, uh, although there are those who claim that. I've not seen it, and I'm, I'm also, I also, I have multiple areas of specialization, only because I don't get out much, uh, like some scholars, and uh, so I spend all my time learning about my ancestors, and, and so far I haven't seen evidence, but I can tell you the Aztec, the Toltecs, and the Teotihuacanos were interacting with the peoples of New Mexico, uh, uh, Arizona, uh, and Colorado, and so one could argue it's not that much of a leap to claim Utah as part of that domain, but they didn't conquer there. I don't believe they originated there, but even the Hopi say peoples from the South brought, brought war to their land. And uh, it's not a complimentary picture, but it does appear that uh, either Toltec or other peoples from the Valley of Mexico did enter uh, the Hopi lands of Northeastern Arizona and uh, north central New Mexico, and were there for turquoise and other things. Thank you. Yes. I have a question. Um, thank you, Dr. Mendoza, for all your research and your life's work that you showed us. Um, my question is Do you think this icon, um, the sun god um, stone, sunstone, uh -huh, this icon is a good one to represent Mexico in a global scale? Oh, yes. In fact, I would argue because uh, you know I have uh, some very dear friends who are very devoted to representing the sunstone, and I've sent them copies of my paper, and they don't respond because let's say they have a very different interpretation. I'm not saying they're wrong. In fact, I celebrate any monument that can bring our people together uh, in ways that this one has. Uh, but I do think that you know whether we want to call it a calendar. Uh, that uh, uh, portends an apocalypse, which people have att attempted to do. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, indirectly, it has to do with the new fire ceremony and the next 52-year cycle. But I do believe that uh, the age of kings and the dynasties of ancient Mexico and the Maya region, uh, they were all centered on ancient Teotihuacan. We have documentation that the Maya from Copan were sending their lords to Teotihuacan to undergo uh, the ceremony of the new fire so they could be invested as kings known as sun, uh, sun-faced lords or fire-born lords or lords born of fire. And now archaeological evidence by Eduardo Matos Moctezuma and a host of others has shown that the great pyramid of the sun, ironically called the pyramid of the sun, has an adosada platform at the front of it. And they have now found evidence that they were conducting a new fire ceremony there. And if you look at the legends uh, of the birth of the fifth son, it begins with a group of gods gathered around a massive fire pit. And they were there to resurrect the sun because it had been extinguished by the previous death of the previous age. And uh, they had two individuals uh, that they had, one of them had been self-selected essentially. And he was a, a, a kind of a horribly diseased individual. He wasn't the class act that you might expect of a god, you know, and instead, uh, another one stepped forth and he was handsome, he was articulate, he was intelligent, he was a looker, in other words, and, but he was also vain, unlike the horribly mutilated uh, individual who was diseased, uh, they both offered to jump into the fire so as to sacrifice themselves for the birth of the fifth son, and when it came time, the gods determined that it would be uh, the handsome individual, uh, the one that was articulate of lordly, you know, uh, noble uh, descent, who would be the son. But when his time came, he hesitated, and his fear overcame him, and he stepped away. And in that moment, the diseased one, Nana Watsin, ran forward and jumped into the fire, and literally rose up as the new son. And then when the uh, vain lord, who had failed to carry out the self-sacrifice, saw this, he became, uh, you know, uh, he was jealous. He ran forward, jumped in, 
and two suns began to rise into the heavens. And the gods realized that if the suns were allowed to rise into the heavens, they would scorch the earth and uh, devastate humanity. So they took a bowl with the imprint of a rabbit in it and they flung it into the heavens and they extinguished the vain sun. And it was extinguished and became the moon where you see the rabbit, if you look closely uh, from, you know, from the area of Mexico, you can see what looks like a rabbit in ears. But the other one became the sun, the fifth sun. And because of the way in which this sacrifice took place, it was deemed that blood sacrifice would be the only way to sustain the sun and bring life and light to the world each dawn. And so therein begins the story of what I construe as the fire ceremony that the Aztecs would perpetuate. And they would have someone who would literally be splayed, sacrificed, and then a fire would be kindled. And that person would become the new sun and the world would be saved. Uh, so it's, um, I, I think that when we go to the sunstone and to get back to your question after that long aside, the reality is the, the sunstone, that commemorative marker that has gone through so much history, so many controversial interpretations was apparent the whole time. It was Yualtecutli, Lord Nine, the last major emperor of the Aztec empire who literally is being reborn as Moctezuma Shokoyotzin, as Yualtecutli and the Lord of Night who brings light to the world after a, a, a lighting with the ancestors in the land of the dead. So literally the juxtaposition of light and life, darkness and death has always been there. And the Aztec sunstone represents that permeable membrane between the underworld and the ancestors and the world of light and life and living. So I think it represents a better uh, analogy uh, or at least a central icon that I think can better unite our communities because it is the juxtaposition of light over darkness, life over death. And it is literally for me an embodiment of all of the greatest poetry, art and life that the Aztecs produced. And it is one of the most sophisticated, complex semiographic systems that I think they ever produced. So yes, to answer your question, uh, I think it is uh, of all things is probably one of the great monuments for Mexican nationalism. But let's face it, uh, the flag represents that. And unfortunately, uh, this monument that is so important has been rendered a lesser uh, piece. And yet I think its, origin, its origins were to celebrate uh, literally uh, the fireborn lords of the new age. Nice, thank you. Thank you. Ruben, you, you, have, um, you mentioned Mitla uh, and that Mitla in archeology span in Oaxaca is there, right? The land of the dead. Yes. So how how was the, how was the Tenochtitlan Aztec Mexica, you know, a capital connected to this part of Oaxaca where Mitla is there? Was that part of is that where people were believed to go rest, or that's where they went to die? It's a, the land of the dead, and then the architecture is very different. The pyramids are different in Oaxaca from let's say the pyramid of the sun and the moon. There, there's a difference, right? There's there's a regionalism. And then I know that with urbanization, what they have found in, in archaeological evidence is, is how the great Tenochtitlan was this big urban center that different indigenous communities of the Americas had their own neighborhoods. They had their own language, their own uh, you know, clothing, their own role in the market. And, and today, Mexico City continues to be a great marketplace, a centralized place of trade and exchange. They have found you know, a lot of the good that came from the Pacific coast coming up the Rio Balsas, going into Mexico City, like this has been trade that has been taking place for thousands of years. But I, I'm really interested, you know, going to Oaxaca and say, this is Aista Mitla, this is the, the land of the dead. And then you mentioned it, you mentioned the same language, the same very similar language in your work uh, addressing the Aztec um, Mexica. Yep. Um, yeah, Mictlan uh, is, is a place that I'd always been fascinated with because uh, since I was in high school, I began studying that. And in fact, in my first paper about Malinalco, that site with the rock cut temples, <coughs> I, uh, I, I tried to understand it because uh, in death, uh, in fact, when I was uh, you know, in high school, I used to carry, I, I carved, hand carved a piece of jade 
on, on what with water and sandstone. And I managed to drill it with a pump drill and a steel tip. And I wore it around my neck, believing that at death, it would be placed in my mouth and my soul would be retained and survive the underworld. That's how far into this I was. Uh, but um, the reality is, is that, you know, I've moved beyond that. And I understand that Mictlan was a place of nine levels and they were all challenges. And I guess in some ways I came to embody that challenge because I have had many challenges in my life, many of which I didn't think I was going to survive. And uh, in the process, each time I, I transcended a level, if you will, I felt renewed, just like the 52 year ceremony. I, I was given new life to move to the next stage in my life. And ultimately I became a professor and author and so on and so forth. And, uh, but Niklan, was a place of the underworld, but it was uh, it was also counterposed against a place called Tamwanchan, the place of flowers. So whereas Mitlan was this place of death and destruction, uh, and in which the only way to get through the underworld and across the rivers, uh, kind of a Hades-like place, and the river Styx, uh, you had to have a isquintli, a, a, a chihuahua, if you will, a dog, to guide you because the only way to see your way in the underworld was through the eyes of the dog. And uh, dogs were often buried with the dead uh, in order to facilitate that passage. And the jade in the mouth was a way to link you back into the earth from whence you came. Uh, uh, Mitla in Oaxaca was a Zapotec palace compound. And it does have underground chambers and it's a fascinating piece of architecture, probably one of the most sophisticated in Mexico. Uh, but I would argue, uh, contrary to some scholars, that all of these communities were linked by a common belief system. And even though the Aztecs took it to a whole different level, uh, you begin to, if you really look at the cosmologies, I am absolutely convinced that much of what the Maya were writing about can be found in Aztec thought and belief, especially its cosmology. Uh, and uh, Michael Coe, who was a prominent Mesoamericanist who passed away a few years ago, uh, I heard a lecture that he did in Texas, and he was, uh, you know, he was of the belief that much of this primordial belief system arrived in the New World with the earliest peoples, and it was retained by the Mesoamericans, and it was elaborated upon. And while the trappings of each culture are distinct and different by virtue of the environments and the languages they spoke, they all had a common belief system. And we find it, whether it's through the question of bloodletting, or blood sacrifice, or just the, 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 the challenge of living life in the villages and in the urban centers, the reality is uh, they may look different, but they manifest virtually identically in terms of thought and belief, especially in terms of iconography and cosmology. There's a core structure there. And that's how I'm able to go from one civilization to another. And I've traveled all over Mexico and Central America doing that and I find common belief. Let me give you one example. There's a symbol uh, called the stepped fret, which is basically like a, a, a step temple. And then, uh, then at the end of it, you see kind of a scroll pattern. I'm trying to do this backwards. Anyway, uh, it's a scroll pattern. And uh, during the course of research, I actually was doing for the Department of Justice because they were looking into gangland iconography at Pelican Bay and they, I guess they were finding a lot of Aztec. And I managed to identify a symbol uh, that appears at Mitla. It appears in many of the palaces and temples of Mexico Tenochtitlan. And I finally realized that what I was looking at was the stepped fret of being an embodiment of the Altepetl, which means the water mountain. So what the steps represent is the mountain. And then the scroll represents uh, the symbol of water. And so combined, you get a belief system centered on the notion of the water mountain. And from that, I was able to extrapolate by way of the study of the Mishashoke and the Mixteca that in fact, they still believe in the water mountain. And they believe that a, a sacred mountains in the landscape are filled with water and they see springs. It, 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 it's only natural they would believe that, but they believe that inside there exists a water serpent, uh, the Kusave, the Kusavi, and the Kusavi manifest as rivers and in the heavens, so on the land and in the sky as a feathered serpent. And so the idea that 
Kukulkan, uh, uh, they pronounce it slightly differently in uh, uh, Wakanda forever, uh, but I was good with that because they were using Yucatec Maya. Uh, in fact, now I'm saying uh, uh, Kukulkan forever. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's my new catchphrase. Uh, uh, but anyway, Kukulkan is the water serpent and the water serpent is linked to all of the representations of the feathered serpents in Mesoamerica. And that in turn is linked to the water mountain, which became the symbol of royal authority because the king and the queen represent uh, basically the life force of a community. They represent the anchor of a community and they represent the mountain of substance, sustenance, as was the case at Teotihuacan. So I'm arguing that the representations of the Kusavi or Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan is in fact an incarnation of the symbol of royal authority. And when you see large pyramidal platforms in any community, uh, they represent the seat of power, the seat of the cacique, uh, basically a kingdom. And, and the way I can validate that is all the way through the 17th century, the Spanish continued to coordinate tribute from these kingdoms because they allowed the kingdoms to persist as long as they paid tribute as they did to the Aztecs. And they refer to each of those sites as Altepetl and Caciques. So the Cacique is the Lord of the Altepetl or the Water Mountain. And I would contend that literally the pyramids of Mesoamerica through all ages represent the mountain of sustenance, the water mountain, and thereby the seat of royal authority. And Mitla is one of those places. Great. So we are out of time. Um, is we have um, any last questions before we conclude from our in-person audience? Uh, Dr. Mendoza. Oh, yes. Uh, Camilo Garcia. Oh, yes. This is fascinating. Uh, I, I, I'm originally from Puerto, like I told you at the beginning, right? Um, and I, I studied there until I was 15. I did my, my secundaria. And it's interesting to me that a lot of these things that you know, you're talking about and that, that I have gone through my studies here in the United States, that it goes in depth as to what it means to be not just Mexicano, but understanding your roots. Yes. Because um, actually there, you know, the education is very controlled by the government. Yes. And very uh, little is talk about this origins. And I'm listening to you in all these words that you're mentioning, right? Just a squinkling. Right, yes. and probably people think here told us quickly, you know, that the dog, right? But there, you know, you say it's quickly, and that's a that's a boy, that's a little boy, right? Uh, and then you're talking about words, and it takes me, it's taking me back to some of the names of, of the towns that I I, I live in, and I I was surrounded by Ashutla, you know, yes. Tegucigo, Amatepetlan. So all these roots, all these words that I um, mean sound and and it kind of like making sense. So my question to you. In, you, in your studies and, and research in Mexico, what has been your experience in actually talking to, to your colleagues in Mexico uh, and, and just putting this back into you know, people because I, I guess this is what people, it, it's given pride to them. It's yes. given them the opportunity to really understand where they came from and maybe the way to keep us, I mean, I wouldn't say keep us down, right? Because yes. You don't want to know your origins. So again, my question is, what has been your experience in Mexico? Um, what have you done in Mexico? Uh, and, and, and just sharing this, this message with, with, with the, the Mexican people, the, the ones from Mexico, the ones from uh, you know, Puebla, you know, Tlaxcala, you know, all this area. And just one more thing before I, I forget. Uh, in the Mixteca Poblana, which is really a vast uh, region, there is a lot of uh, still ruins to be, uh, you know, discover and explore. And, and the, the reason why I tell you that is because growing up there, I remember that we used to run into uh, stones, right, with lots of symbols. And they used to be taken by people as part of a, a display, you know, in their homes. Yes. Yeah. So, but anyway, so, so again, if you have had any experience in that area and uh, your experience in working with, with uh, your colleagues in Mexico. Yes, I, I have, and I've worked in the Virgen de la Cañadad. Unfortunately, that ended tragically when one of my students died of an aneurysm, and I literally caught him before he hit the ground. 
and then I had to get him out of Mexico, but my colleagues there were very supportive. Um, I worked at Cholula Puebla doing excavation, and my work was undermined by uh, uh, an American archaeologist uh, who uh, didn't seem to have a problem with uh, removing uh, cultural heritage for his personal use. And when I confronted him, he created a lot of problems for me. Uh, and even so, uh, I continue to work in Mexico. I've traveled virtually every state. Anything I talk about, I believe I have to see. I have to experience it because I believe that experience is a, a fundamental source of the wisdom that comes with uh, you know, uh, the information and the knowledge that one can garner from these sites. I've, uh, I had at a very early point in my life a desire to photograph every archaeological zone in Mexico. And then I found out there were 130,000 of them that, and most of them have never been explored. So I realized, well, my time's up and maybe I'll get down there a few more times. But uh, the reality is, is that I, I think it's important. Um, and, and maybe I'll close with this because when you looked at my bio, you saw California mission excavations. Well, the California missions are very controversial. I knew that when I first started doing work in them and I've been attacked at every imaginable level. And what my uh, ultimate uh, desire was uh, from the time I was uh, 15 going into farm labor camps in Arvin and Delano to speak to migrant workers uh, in the, the shacks they were living in, I'd, I'd given talks in Delano. Uh, my uh, ultimate objective was to try to uh, get our youth to have pride um, uh, in their heritage because I grew up being told my, my heritage was worthless basically. Uh, or it was minimized or never discussed. And so I know the value and the hunger that we have for this to know who we are. Uh, and so whenever I've given talks, I've, I've always directed to the indigenous because when I started, indigenous peoples were being savaged in the classroom. Well, then the other end of it was uh, the California missions, the adobes, the rancheros were all being uh, basically attacked uh, for having been colonialists. Well, the reality is most of the world's populations have either been the, the co uh, colonists or the colonized. Uh, that's a fact of the matter in the Americas, uh, both in pre-Columbian and later times. I took on that challenge knowing full well that it would be problematic, but I'm an architectural historian, ironically, but people keep trying to pull me into their politics over this. And uh, I've been able to extract a lot of knowledge and science. And I also know that unless we're prepared to venture into the world of darkness, to see the light, we will never see the light. And for me, crossing that boundary and accepting an invitation to work in the California missions opened up an entire new world. Uh, there are over a quarter million documents written by the Spanish friars in California for the 60 or so year period of the California missions. And they have a wealth of information about the indigenous communities. Uh, they have a wealth of in information about uh, the, the Hispanic communities of California. And just recently in my role as uh, the vice president of Monterey County Historical Society, uh, my colleagues and I submitted 20,000 uh, so-called Spanish archival documents, all originals from 1770 to 1850 that have a direct bearing on the history of our people in California. And yet virtually all the history books of this region on the Monterey Bay mentioned little to nothing about the rancheros, the land grants, the Mexican Indians that came to this land to work with the indigenous populations. We're left out of the picture completely. And I plan to change that. And now that I'm retiring, which is at the end of uh, December, I plan to devote uh, what's left of my time uh, to uh, write a history that is inclusive of our communities, regardless of whether they were construed as Spaniards or Mexicanos or Mestizos or Mexican Indians, because we are a major impetus to that story. We just don't get the credit. And we not need to start demanding that the histories, whether written by our communities or by American scholars, include that history because we are fundamental. One, one final, anyone have one final question? We have time for one final. Uh, Ruben, I, I know that our students, I know, thank you so much for hosting today. I, I, I keep on saying, I'm just going to pop in for a little bit, but then I want you to know these, these amazing scholars and, and people who are allowed to tell us or to share with a little bit more about our history. But some of the work you've done on missions has been centered on its geography, 
and it's alignment with the sun. So I wonder, because most folks have not read that work on the windows and the sun coming in to illuminate the altars. Can you just, I know it's a whole different topic or chapter of your life, but what was it that you found when you started doing your mission archaeology? Well, you know, I it's ironic because uh, when people ask me, what's your greatest discovery? I rarely mention that one, but that's probably the one I'm uh, known for worldwide. I, I just submitted a manuscript to a, a publisher in the Netherlands. They requested it for a volume on light in medieval churches. And essentially, uh, I don't take credit for the first discovery, but I do take credit for the scholarly uh, interpretation and for the discoveries of every church and mission building thereafter. And, I, uh, and I'm always in the crosshairs because people want me to say, oh, it was the Spaniards that did this because they were so brilliant. Or it was the Indians trying to dupe the Spaniards. No, I don't go with those arguments. I believe that these were collective communities. Whatever they believed of one another and however they treated one another, the reality is they had to work together. Two, uh, maybe a single friar or a uh, you know, Spanish priest or two and seven soldiers do not make an empire. And it was the indigenous communities that built these mission buildings. And, and I understand the historical trauma behind them. But the reality is in studying them, I was looking at the architectural history and I began seeing patterns uh, in the lighting of the interiors of these churches. And ultimately what that became is at San Juan Bautista, the tabernacle on the church through a window in the main facade uh, would be illuminated. And of course the tabernacle is an ancient device used to hold the body, either the Torah in the earliest period or the body and the blood of Christ. And in, in Mexico, the way the conversion proceeded, and I'm, I've grown absolutely fascinated with Franciscan cosmology, because as I noted earlier, they believed the apocalypse was imminent. Uh, they also had the belief that there was a Cristo Helios, born of the Roman tradition, and that that son would come back to the earth to uh, basically save us all. And uh, uh, the Cristo Helios was adopted by the indigenous peoples of Mesoamerica, and it's still identified as that. Uh, in the uh, Sierra de Puebla, uh, uh, in, in a place called Postecli, there's a mountain and there's a cross at the top. And every year, just before the summer solstice, the native peoples of that region, the Mishashoke, literally do a pilgrimage of several days all the way to the top of the mountain. And when they get to the top, all the way, they do blood sacrifice of animals. All the way to the top, they leave flowers on altars all the way up as though it was Dia de los Muertos. They get to the top to celebrate the Cristo Helios, uh, Helios uh, uh, the, 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 basically the, the solar Christ. And the solar Christ and the cross represent the light of the sun. So in a way, what was being practiced with the commemoration of the sunstone, I contend, was continued via indigenous beliefs identified with the solar Christ. And so the churches were being aligned such that the tabernacles or the saints are illuminated on their feast days. And I, I can send you a couple of those publications as well. I have some of that on academia.edu, although I haven't uh, posted anything there. I've had quite a few publications and I haven't posted them. I, I just feel they're a little too commercial for my liking. I'm starting to uh, post more things on, on uh, uh, ResearchGate uh, because I think it's uh, uh, they have a little more integrity, let's say. Uh, but anyway, the idea is that I now realize of the 150,000 churches built in Mexico over the course of about a century and a half, and that's a world record, I might note, art historians say it was the greatest period of building activity on the planet uh, through much of world history, and it happened in Mexico. And so I'm trying to understand that, and I would contend that fully a third, uh, fully a fourth to possibly a third or maybe a half of all of the churches ever constructed integrate this solar geometry intended to bring light into the sanctuaries in such a way that it illuminated the most sacred objects in these churches. Uh, but I, yeah, I'd be happy to send you a copy of, maybe I'll send you the latest uh, proof, which will be in a book coming out in December, I believe it is. Uh, so that's, um, I, yes, uh, yesterday I went to a memorial uh, for a friend. She was 102 years old and I went there um, and I didn't really know anybody. So I sat down with Sam Farr, the congressman, the former com congressman. And he introduced me to the person next to him and said, 
oh, yes, this is Dr. Mendoza. He absolutely revol revolutionized the interpretation of the architecture of the missions. And I thought, well, no tanto, pero, you know, más o menos. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a lot of ideas and I don't let uh, academic, uh, you know, the scholarly community suppress me. They've tried. Uh, I get into a lot of trouble. My, my grad advisor sent me a nasty note not wanting to have anything to do with me because of my arguments that the Maya were in central Mexico and had something to do with the fall of Teotihuacan. He, he wrote me this nasty letter and then a year and a half later wanted me to hire one of his students into our department. Um, but anyway, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I, I'm just saying, we're, I'm so glad, you know, that you are in the classroom and that you have inspired generations and generations of scholars. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, uh, Aslan forever. <laughs> <laughs> On the topic of inspiring um, scholars, we just want to leave, I want to leave you here with uh, Dr. Mendoza's work, uh, The War of Heaven, a Repaso of the Aztec Sunstone in Light of Nahuatl Cos Cosmogenesis and the New Fire Ceremony of 1507 AD. So if you want to read more about Dr. Mendoza's work, um, for those of you who are online, you can click right here on the uh, Google Drive link. And for those of you joining um, in person, just simply scan the QR code that you have there for the uh, flyer for today's event. Mm -hmm. And um, you can keep on learning about Dr. Mendoza's work. But for now, this is the end of our session. Too. So we want to conclude with a virtual round of applause as well as a in-person round of applause. Gracias. And Vanessa, thank whoever did the flyer brought in the rays of light, and I that was brilliant. I don't know who did that, but Ruben, that's that that's a flyer in your monarchy of your life's work. A simple, simple token of our gratitude. I thought it was brilliant. Thank you. Siempre adelante. Eh? I don't know. was around here, but she just brought in the light to your flyer. I don't even know how they did that. It was so I, I I was impressed that you were able to turn this around so quickly. That was amazing. There's yeah. a little away, and then yeah. I look forward to visiting you soon. Thank okay. you. Well, I look forward to seeing you, Gina. Gracias. Gracias. Un abrazo desde el Valle Imperial. Gracias. Igualmente. I was like 21 years old. It is so much. Because they can't.